So welcome to our first FICA of the year. Um, for those of you who joined us last year, you'll have a good idea of, of what we do and uh, what we talk about. And this month we're tackling SDG 8, um, Decent Work and Economic Growth, and in particular 8.9, which states that by 2030, uh, we will devise and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism, which creates jobs, promotes local culture and products. And we'll be discussing the broader impact of the current issues with our high streets and associated places, with a focus on how COVID has exacerbated the decline that we've seen in many of our towns and cities over the last couple of decades. And I think everyone here will agree we urgently need a reboot. And we hope that the work of the High Streets Task Force in particular and others will achieve this where many previous initiatives have unfortunately failed. So I'd like to welcome Ben Stevenson, who's a placemaking consultant and fellow of the Institute of Place Management. Wendy Madden, who is the High Street Project Manager and Design Project Officer with Bath and Northeast Somerset Council. And Emily Wooderson, who's an Associate Landscape Architect at Arup and member of the High Streets Task Force. Um, all experts in this particular field. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Romy. I'm the commercial director here at Vestra in the UK. Um, and we're going to have more of a conversational session today following some short presentations from Ben, Emily and Wendy. So please do add your questions into the Q&A tab and join in the conversation when we get to that point. We'd be very glad to hear your thoughts and uh, questions on, on the topic. So as if high streets weren't suffering enough already with the changes in society over the last decade, and particularly the rise of online shopping, it seems, COVID-19 has probably been the final straw for many places. And this today is going to be a consideration of what this means to the people who live in, work in and visit our town centres. And this is an infographic I found, which I think pretty clearly um, states the, the issues around this decline um, in terms of recession, obviously. And this is a global issue in terms of the SDGs. That's certainly the way it's approached. But we wanted to look at it from a local UK standpoint. And it's impacting jobs hugely, as we all know, with young people in retail and hospitality probably being some of the hardest hit. Um, housing, degraded public realm, tourism, obviously, and of course, all of our physical and mental health in association with those aspects. So the impact's been huge and continues to be huge and truly devastating in some places. So enough from me. I think it's time to hear from the experts. Um, you're going to see three short presentations from Ben, Emily and Wendy, who will give their individual takes and unique insight into the subject and please remember those questions or or hold the thoughts because we'll be talking these through afterwards so ben is going to introduce um, the situation we find ourselves in and a, and a broader view of the potential solutions to deliver this recovery which is so badly needed so um, over to you ben okay Raymond, do you want to stop sharing your screen That's yes yeah Right, go. Okay. Okay, can we all see that? Yes. Jolly good. Hello everyone, how are you? Happy Friday, it's a lovely sunny day out there. Um, right, so yeah, my name is Ben Stevenson. I'm a placemaking consultant, um, fellow of the, fellow of the uh, Institute of Place Management, working on the High Streets Task Force, helping to develop that programme as well. Um, and I'm going to whip through um, just some sort of facts and figures about the high street, where, where we are, why we are, where we are, and what's sort of going to happen. I've, put, I've entitled this The Great Reset, but I've only just recently realised that The Great Reset is the QAnon, is the term for the QAnon thing where, where Donald Trump uh, declares martial law and rounds everyone up. So I don't mean that Great Reset, I mean a different one, that high street. So, um, I just want to look at some of the data. I just want to start with this um, this image. It seems so long ago. This is when I was chief exec at the um, Waterloo Business Improvement District, and it's just it, it's almost impossible to think that we could ever get back to scenes like this. This is the the World Cup where we screened um, one of the with the England match actually one of the last England matches. Uh, on the street and all of these people came down. We had no idea that that would happen. But I wanted to start this image just to show um, 
show what it used to be like uh, and just to just to remind you about what high streets are and lower marsh is one of our sort of flagship streets it, it, and, and the reason why i want to talk about it today is just because it, it it's sort of microcosm of the of the perfect high street um we talk a lot about independence this idea about independence and and you know there the, that, that's what we, we're really all trying to get back to but actually the high street economy is really really complicated and somewhere like lower marshes was successful because it had independence but it also had a street market it was a cut through to a major um transport interchange it had um you know uh, co-working spaces it had a boots you know and, and and i think when we start thinking about the ecosystem of high streets is a lot more complicated than just saying let's have a a, a, a yarn shop or whatever um so the I think you know not all high streets are like Lower Marsh, and I think we've had decline in high streets for quite a while now. And I just wanted to look at some of the data that we've got um, that that sort of tells us a little bit about the story. So this is the um, foot. I mean, obviously, footfall is a key sort of metric when it comes to measuring performance. And you can see uh, in this slide uh, from Springboard that footfall had declined by a fifth between 2010 and 2019. You can see the big uh, initial decline being sort of post the initial recession as we're heading into another recession. Um, that is what that sort of picture looks like. And, and there are two key culprits. Um, I mean, it predates all of this and pretty certainly predates the pandemic, but there are two key culprits that I know that you will know. And the first is um, out of town shopping, uh, which particularly in the 1990s where it really reached its peak uh, had diverted about uh, up to about 30% of, of uh, town centre retail spend um, into out-of-town shopping, uh, which is a really, really big blow and started some major vacancy rates at that point. And the second, uh, of course, is online shopping. Um, and that that's, so in 2019, 25% of all um, uh, uh, retail spend was online. Uh, and it sort of masks some disparities, which I can talk about in a second. The footfall change is the first one. This is um, the drop in stores within the 1950s. So we're really seeing this big decline even from the 1950s onwards. And the big reason behind the, the number of stores dropping um, between about 580,000 was like that the sort of 1950s high street of our imaginations is really about daily trips to the high street you go to the butchers and then you go off to the bakers and you know you, you, you go to all of these different independents um that really that really changed a lot with retail concentration with the grocery market being concentrated in tiny amounts of hands this sort of high street anywhere where you have the same stores again and again um and yeah so that meant lots lots um lots of lots of change over time um Big winners and losers since the pandemic, and I have to just point out, this is a 2018 forecast. That 2022 figure is likely to be a lot lower um, as we sort of factor in the impact of the pandemic. But big closures happening now, happening now on the streets. Um, a huge disparity, actually, in terms of the, the different sectors. So groceries remain particularly buoyant, uh, both online and on the high street. But we're seeing lots of shops closed, particularly in the sort of fashion, footwear sectors. And it, it sort of makes us wonder a little bit about the support that was offered uh, by the government um, and whether that was sort of correctly targeted. And obviously, Tesco's and a number of supermarkets have given back uh, some of their business rates relief and you know, furlough uh, funding um, as a result of, of, of being able to pay huge dividends to their, um, their, their shareholders. Um, West End dropped uh, two billion, I think it was, over Christmas uh, in terms of sales. Uh, in the coming months, we're going to see lots of CVAs, lots of high street closures, um, and you can already see it affecting our, our, our town centres now. Um, so, just in terms of the pandemic, specifically those sort of main metrics: retail vacancy up to thirteen point two in twenty twenty. Again, mass some disparities. So, shopping centres. Is 16.3% now vacancy, but you will see uh, shopping centres that are almost entirely vacant now, um, sort of evoking that that you know, quite a lot of the the um, trends that you're seeing in America now, where you have entirely um, abandoned malls now, um, which is a real problem. Footfall uh, is down 
an, an additional 64% down from that 20, 20%. So we're on 84% down, not looking like it's going to recover uh, to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and online shopping um, is, 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 again, you know, that 36%, that was a 10-year forecast, but we sort of reached that in a year. Um, really interesting, uh, particularly because pre-pandemic, um, uh, people bought a lot online when it came to clothes and um, it didn't really, grocery was not taking off. People were, it was, it was, it was taking quite a long time to catch on grocery, but obviously it's now really, really habit forming and people have got a lot more used to shopping online. So we won't necessarily see that return uh, to pre-pandemic shopping uh, habits. Now, um, we don't want to just talk about shopping. High streets are often a sort of uh, shortcut, isn't it, for shopping when we talk about the high street on the news. But there are lots of sectors and they've all been hit uh, in lots of different ways. The office market's a really interesting one. Obviously, we've seen huge changes. There was a recent study suggesting that only 7% of people wanted to return to the old days where they just worked full time in the office. And of course, a lot of businesses are now trying to figure out how they redesign in order to make that a reality. And while there are huge advantages, um, both in terms of the individuals themselves, when it comes to um, you know, uh, um, uh, work-life balance, all of that time and money they spend on the commute, and also economically as well, when it comes to that, um, the sort of redistribution into suburbs and, and town centers, particularly satellite towns, you know, redistribution of daytime spending power, there are also massive, massive problems. The transport network is not really viable without having that daytime uh, commuting population. City centers are really uh, problematic in terms of their economies. There are lots of, they're relying on lots of footfall for that work. We don't, we, you know, we, we sort of forget younger people, particularly in this and what what, what a sort of office environment means for them in terms of being, get, being able to sort of get on in the world and also in terms of their home lives and, 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 and you know, their ability to be able to work uh, in, in like a big shared house you've got, you know, you're sat in your bedroom. Um, so all of those are really problematic. Um, the uh, hospitality sector, 660,000 of its 3.6 million jobs have already gone. We're expecting to see more going uh, over the next few uh, years. It's really gonna take four years for that industry to recover. The hotel market has been decimated, um, only made 29 pounds a room uh, in 2020, as, a, as opposed to 129 in 2019. Um, the, um, so sorry, the, the culture, leisure uh, and entertainment markets, 45% drop in GBA. Uh, uh, on 20, 2019 levels. Again, it's going to take years for that to recover. We forget the suppliers to these industries. A lot of them weren't supported in the same way as the, the, the um, sectors that were supported on the high street, particularly things like business rates, uh, relief, um, and of course, tourism. Uh, you know, we're talking about the SDG, hugely, hugely problematic. Uh, people not booking uh, ho uh, holidays or hotels um, in January, as we'd expect. So we're going to see impacts across 2021 as well as 2020. Um, so what we're trying to do is get is start considering what the opportunities are for transformation. Obviously, we, we've got a, a, a very low point to get back to, but there are forces at work when it comes to uh, promoting sustainable transformation of our town centres and high streets. But of course, there are also forces at work that are trying to get us back to that status quo, however much that represents decline for many, many people and many types of businesses. All of this is happening against the backdrop of recession, uh, of um, Brexit, political upheaval on, on the other side of the pond. Um, and it's, you know, we, we are really now facing a real sort of watershed moment. And that's why we talk about this great, great reset. Now, one of the organisations that is sort of potentially quite central to this, and there's quite a lot of government money coming into high streets as well, many of you will know, is the um, High Streets Task Force. Um, it's run by the Institute for Place Management um, that I support, um, but it's also a partnership of 13 uh, organisations, uh, four professional bodies, RTPI, Landscape Institute, uh, Design Council, and, and of course the IPM, but it's got other uh, it's got sort of support from uh, data and research organisations, 
um, the uh, youth voice in the teenage market and also communities represented uh, in civic voice. Um, so the five year program, it's piloting already. So I'm going virtually to Preston next week to, to, to run a pilot with them. Uh, and it's a, it's a huge uh, program which involves major support. It involves sort of networking uh, town centers to develop plans. But the main thing, uh, and what I will end on, is um, is this is this idea about partnerships and local partnerships. It's about bringing a much wider uh, group of, uh, of different players and stakeholders into developing the vision for the high street. <clears throat> and that's sort of reflected in uh, this Sir John Timpson quote, and, and his report in 2018 really sparked all of this off. It's this idea, inspirational local leaders working in collaboration with all sections of their community have put a buzz back into their town centre. That's what we're working towards. I will leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, we've had one question, but I think from Stefano, who, but I think uh, we will get to that in the following presentation. So we'll hold that for now. Um, Emily's next and uh, going to be adding some detail to this topic and following up from what Ben's just spoken about, and particularly the importance of um, planning, implementation and monitoring um, when these uh, when these measures have been implemented. So I'll hand over to you, Emily, if that's OK. Absolutely. I'll just share my presentation. Hopefully that's on the screen. Um, so what I wanted to talk through really was following on from Ben's points there about the challenges and complexities of our high street. One of the most important things really that I feel is that we need to look towards a partnership approach. So a way that we can combine our efforts to improving these spaces um, and looking towards the future. So I think really uh, the key points about creating a joined up approach are the importance of having a shared ambition. Um, so looking towards all of those stakeholders, all of those partners from the local authorities down to the landowners, the retailers and the community itself and looking at actually what is our ambition? What are our goals for the future of the high street? Next steps, I think, is really important then to have a clear and pragmatic vision to how are you going to deliver those goals? What is the way forward and actually what does it look like? What is the end result that you're hoping to achieve? And that is really ensures that all of those partners and those groups are collaborating and working together. I think it's then really important that you have a framework for delivery. So how do all of those partners, how do all those individuals, how do all of those teams play in together and how do they fit together and how do they find a way that they can work and look towards creating that vision? Finally, I think the other key ingredient is monitoring and management. So it's looking forward, it's looking at learning from what's been implemented, learning from that process and then sharing and communicating with others what, that, what you found and what's been a success and then looking to build upon that as you go through this process again. I'm going to talk to you now about two examples of projects that I've been working on which use this approach and I think they can create quite replicable models that we can use in other scenarios. So the first one is Wild West End. Um, this is a partnership I've been involved in since its inception in 2015. Um, this project is really about greening, but it's very much applicable um, to the public realm and high streets themselves. So in 2015, um, we worked really with a small group of landowners in the West End of London who wanted to see a greener West End. They wanted to see more green space in London. Um, so we really, we talked to them and developed this shared ambition. We created quite a simple um, set of goals, so about improving well-being of people, enhancing biodiversity, and also raising awareness of the benefits of green space. And that was really the goals that we set out for the partnership to achieve. As part of this process, we wanted to create a combined partnership. So we wanted to get levels of people and layers of people working and communicating together. So we gained support from the Greater London Authority and also from London Wildlife Trust, so strategic partners who could help to inform that vision. Um, the landowners working together and also business improvement districts and alongside that a group of key stakeholders so the local authority um, residents groups tenants groups and other associations as well the next steps was really about setting a clear vision at the beginning so really the vision of the partnership was to increase greening in the west end and it was looking at the ways that these partners would be able to do this 
So both through putting more green space on their buildings right down to the public realm and improving that space. To help with that, we set out a series of clear targets and also key performance indicators. So when all of this green space was going in, we could look back and we could monitor over time the progress against those targets. And also each of those partners knew the certain ambitions that they were working towards. So in this case, we identified five typologies um, and five values that by installing green space, you can look to improve. And we set out really a sort of key detailed matrix of how they could build that up and how they could do that both individually and collaboratively together. We then looked towards a framework for delivery. So with all of these different partners involved, many of them had their own public realm initiatives, their own greening strategies. But what we wanted to do is create a framework that could pull all of those components together. So it meant that the partners wouldn't be working in isolation, but when they worked on their strategies, they were working towards a bigger whole, which was really beneficial in looking at a wider strategy and achieving greater goals and also spreading more awareness about what we we're doing. The final component that was really important in this project is monitoring. And as this partnership is ongoing and still continues to this day, we have a monitoring um, program where every two years and um, there's a detailed monitoring. Um, but during that time, we're also monitoring and reviewing uh, information about how successful spaces are, how successful installations have been and what we can do to feed back into that partnership and continue to improve and shape our way forward. This is an example here about a parklet that was installed. Um, by the partners, um, by business improvement districts and the local authority in collaboration. Um, and through this monitoring, we really undertook a detailed analysis of how people use the space, because in this area, we wanted to particularly understand about the benefits of health and well-being. So we did surveys with the public and with the users of the space to understand the impacts of that. This then obviously fed back into our wider key performance indicators. So in terms of that health and well-being value, part of this monitoring fed into that year's program, um, alongside looking at other space, other opportunities, like the way we were increasing access to spaces uh, and how people could really get in touch and communicate and attend events. Um, while we're doing this monitoring, we're always looking back and monitoring against a baseline. So that's really key to understand and show progress um, and look towards how we're then going back to achieving those goals. And I think this is really an applicable model that we can use in our high streets. Something that we can look is identifying some of those key components, some of those key benefits and values. And we can use this model to really understand and create tangible goals that we can then work towards throughout creative partnerships. The second project I'm going to show you briefly is Liverpool Without Walls. So this is a project um, that I was working on last year, and it was particularly in response to the COVID pandemic. Um, as you can see, we were looking here at a couple of streets in Liverpool um, as a pilot project, so particularly Castle Street and Bold Street, which in the pandemic has suddenly become quiet and silent. Previously to that, um, there were fantastic high streets and spaces with lots of independent shops, independent retailers and independent eateries. And it was really sort of vibrant place. And unfortunately, with social distancing measures, this all sort of really stopped and became a bit quiet. What we wanted to look at with Liverpool was a rapid way that they could actually transform this space quite quickly. So we were looking really at parklets um, and short term temporary ways to transform the space and monitor it over time. So some of those smaller steps that we looked at are about traffic closures, um, places that we could implement parklets. And what the team did um, is Liverpool City Council looked to really grant um, to award grants to local businesses to enable them to purchase parklets or street furniture to put outside their business. So this really helped in the pandemic where we're in the stage of social distancing to enable places to still spill out and have more space to continue for their businesses to thrive. We had to find a few ways to adapt to the new normal. Um, so in that process and part of our vision, we we're all looking and working together about what those new requirements were. So some of these things are about perhaps revisiting what perhaps a traditional parklet might look like and how that might work in the times of social distancing and what some of those measures we might have to implement could be to help make sure that people stayed safe. We also wanted to make sure that this was flexible going forward. So if these ideas were to continue beyond the pandemic or if the situation was to change, the parklets could then be adapted in response. Um, there's a couple of uh, views here of the parklets. Um, one of the beautiful things about all of these groups coming together, so the bid, um, the city council and the design team to work towards the approach meant that actually we were able to deliver these parklets in six weeks. So it was a really rapid transformation um, 
enabling all the businesses to spill out onto the street, um, streets to be pedestrianized. And all of a sudden, it really supported these local businesses and they could start um, serving people again and bringing people back to the high street. In terms of the monitoring, um, part of this was really measuring its success um, and speaking to local businesses and understanding how this space had transformed. Um, the sort of the, the findings were really that people were suddenly quite engaged with this high street. I think partly because of the excitement of being able to spend time outdoors again and go out and be with other people, albeit social distance, but also because there was quite a radical transformation of the space. All of a sudden you weren't competing with cars and you had spaces to sit outside and people said it felt very much like a European cafe culture. As part of that monitoring, um, which is still ongoing to this day, we can see a lot of um, the benefits that it produced. Um, so overall support was given to 88 businesses in this pilot area. Um, restaurants and cafes and bars were able to cater for more people. Um, and also a lot of those businesses were able to bring staff back from furlough. Uh, we also saw a lot of additional sales during this COVID time uh, where everything was quite quiet in the whole. So overall, it was a really positive response and something that showed uh, a sort of creative approach and something where working in partnership enabled it to be done very quickly um, and create really quite a radical transformation in a short space of time. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. That's great. Um, I think before we bring Wendy on, I've just got one question here, which we might just answer now uh, from Stefano. Uh, in terms of the greening of the West End study by Arup, was GIS used? And if so, how and what data source sources? Yeah, absolutely. So we've been using um, GIS um, throughout the process. So we gather data from all of the partners um, and that's um, through our monitoring. So every two years we monitor the spaces uh, by looking at the quality, the area, the typologies, and all of this is recorded in a data, in a GIS database. Um, we then look with, work with Wild, London Wildlife Trust to record monitoring of bird species, bat species, and other things. And all of that data is then recorded in a space that can then be shared with others like Giggle. And also it's shown publicly on our website, uh, the Wild West End website, so people can engage with it and see the transformation over time. Okay, brilliant. I hope that's answered the question. I would say so. <laughs> Thanks. And Wendy, if you're ready to uh, start sharing your screen, Wendy's going to talk about, uh, as, as well as Emily, with some case studies and uh, actual work that's been completed in Bath over the last year or so, um, but particularly uh, since COVID, and what's been carried out and achieved and learnings from the last uh, couple of years of these projects. So over to you, Wendy. Yeah, thanks, Romy, um, and thanks to Vestra for inviting us to speak today um, around the topic that's been keeping us busy the past few months. Um, just for a bit of background, our team is externally project funded to design and deliver high streets and renewal projects. So our team has backgrounds in urban design, planning, conservation, working with bids. Um, we've got various funding pots to deliver projects. So um, West of England Combined Authorities love our high streets programme. Historic England's High Street Heritage Action Zone programme, and we also access some in, um, internal community infrastructure levy to do some of these improvements as well. And um, the projects comprise public realm improvements and animation from new market squares and market towns up to kind of animation in the city centre, which is one of the projects I'm going to touch on today. And I think it's worth saying that we're really lucky in that we've been scoping and designing these projects and undertaking pilot activities for a few years now to inform um, these various projects. So the importance of them has been elevated through COVID, but we kind of had a, a head start, if you will, um, which allowed us to react and kind of refocus in the context of the pandemic. Um, so given the time constraints, I'll just touch on one of our um, projects and go through it in some detail. So um, Milsom Street is one of Bath's most historic high streets, home to one of the oldest department stores in the UK. Um, despite this, the area has really struggled over the last decade to kind of maintain its competitive retail edge um, and the vacancy rates have been increasing and footfall decreasing. One of the challenges um, with Milsom Street is its location and um, it's at the top of Bath kind of city centre with the train station to the south. Um, so it's kind of an uphill, decent uphill distance from the train station to get there um, and through the kind of main retail core and tourist core. 
and really it's been struggling to compete with the privately owned shopping center that's by the train station to the south which has a huge kind of public realm budget and contemporary buildings which means it can deliver really kind of creative animation and really draw footfall in 2018 we included milsom street in bath's um, christmas market for the first time so that tested the principle of closing the street for um, an 18-day period and that showed there was really increased levels of footfall and it brought many benefits to the retailers and restaurants in the area so from this basis um, we use this to inform one of our pilot activities which was the love milsom street event so this is really a pilot activity to kind of reimagine the space um, on international car free day 2019 we worked in partnership with the bid visit bath local landlords and the businesses to deliver the event um, and the intention was really to kind of reprioritize the public space so reclaim the whole carriageway as public space for a weekend to learn how the space could function and what kind of animation the businesses and the public might want to see so this included um, a street garden outdoor dining street food um, bars as well on these photos from the Saturday, which is a beautiful sunny day, as you can imagine on the Sunday, it then absolutely chucked it down. Um, but the feedback was really positive. So we had 50 businesses involved, 40,000 pedestrian movements, 17% higher flow rate than a comparable weekend in a previous year. And 50% of businesses thought they had an increase in sales and 96% of businesses said they support more closures in events like this. So this kind, this pilot activity began to sh shape the scope of the future project um, that we were planning. However, then um, obviously COVID hit. So there was this accelerated decline of the high street and increasing vacancy rates. Um, this photo here kind of ironically shows us what we want to get back to and it, it kind of reflects Ben's um, World Cup in, image in a way this kind of busy um, public space with some lovely street dressing. Um, however, it's obviously really far removed from where we find ourselves today. Um, we'll, up in Milsom Street, there's a really wide carriageway. So that allowed us to put in a bus gate and implement footway widening in the parking bays for social dis distancing initially, with a view to really hopefully making that a more permanent um, reclamation of, of public realm in the future. And there'd been a rapid um, increase in vacancy rates in the north in particular with some really large high street units such as Gap Kids lost during um, summer 2020. And the council as a key landlord in this area was obviously acutely aware of these losses. So one of our um, initial projects in response to the pandemic was um, our vacant shopfront animations project. So the businesses noted to us the kind of visual and experiential impact of having empty shop fronts on the high street. And um, so we delivered a variety of interventions that you can see on the screen to animate empty windows and try and support pop up shops. Um, some even incorporated the COVID and public health messaging you can see at the bottom. So we kind of used our communications budgets in a slightly more creative way um, and designed and delivered some of these with a local carnival group who were essentially out of work during the pandemic. And um, so this, the really cool polar bear you can see here, all these little lanterns above him um, were made by volunteers at home through like a guided workshop. So that was kind of really cool way to continue those, that creative and um, voluntary workshops even during the pandemic. Um, and the images along the bottom show one of our projects, which um, in the space of a few months went from kind of empty to one of our animations to then letting it as a pop up shop over the Christmas period. And they're actually still there because they've done pretty well. So that's kind of one of the examples that we're really proud of through this pilot project to prove it really does work. Um, so and it's also worth noting that because of social distancing and the pandemic, you're, we obviously weren't able to do a lot of the animations in the public realm that we might usually do. So this is a really cool way to kind of animate and create interest in the public realm um, without having any issues around social distancing. And these were all delivered in a really collaborative way with our kind of in, internal property teams, licensing teams, as well as externally with the bid um, and these kind of um, voluntary groups. So these kind of pilot activities um, last year have now informed a larger vacant units action project. So we've taken kind of learning from the pilots to inform this wider bid and there's a hierarchy of interventions from the really low cost interventions like window graphics where actually you don't even have to go inside the building to, to put those in place to then um, kind of capital upgrades to the building to deliver pop up uses and meanwhile uses that kind of more permanently use the space. Um, one of our other projects, so once we put in the um, 
the access restriction and um, bus gate, what it meant was that we could reclaim some of these parking bays for parklets, kind of similar to as Emily was discussing earlier. So we'd um, delivered parklets in Kingsmead Square, which are the, the images to the left. And this has been a really successful pilot working with um, the local councillors, cabinet members, local landlords and local businesses to put these in place and they were really well received. So that meant in the Milson Quarter, which are the images on the right hand side, we were in a, in, in a position to kind of sell these to the businesses and say, look, this is what we can achieve. So we used a really similar colour palette, um, but obviously the individual parklets respond to the specific street scene and, and how people might use the space. We're taking these kind of pilot projects and moving forward um, with Milson Quarter, um, they've kind of informed a comprehensive renewal program that we're planning for the next kind of five years. Um, the interventions are all really quick to deploy, flexible and responsive, which means we can truly collaborate with the businesses and the public and the bid to, to get out of, um, of the street what we want at any one time. And it means we can do kind of various iterations of the interventions so visitors keep coming back um, and to kind of ensure that the street's Instagrammable, if you will, and interesting for visitors. Um, and it, this wouldn't be able, this wouldn't be possible without internal working with highways and events teams, plus developing these proposals with the top of the town traders group, which is led by the bid. Um, and the projects include, include seasonal street dressings, overhead installations and call for crossings. Um, to engage artists and creative groups, comprehensive greening at kind of intervals of the streets, street furniture refresh, events and animation programs such as the street closes that we discussed and some active travel infrastructure. So a whole suite of improvements that we can kind of rotate over the five years to, to keep the space interesting. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning one of, as Emily mentioned, one of the, the benefits of the pandemic is, is really allowing or encouraging the businesses to spill out into the street scenes and put in the public space. So one of the easiest things that we did in response to COVID was to go proactively go and speak to the food and beverage businesses and invite them to use the street. So take them through the, the pavement license process and do, draw up the plans for them, find a layout that works for them and works for the street um, to really animate the streets in a kind of safe, um, socially distanced way, which costs nothing to us besides a bit of design and re design time and resource, but has such a transformational impact on the city. Um, so by combining the vacant units project and the um, renewal project with all these different animations, um, we can kind of renew the high street as a whole um, and create an interesting and changing public realm over time. Um, I also thought it would be worth um, mentioning the data that we use to kind of underpin the proposals and allow us to monitor over time. So we have two data cells um, in the city that are owned by BathBid and operated by movement strategies. And that, that gives us a quarterly dashboard of information that we can draw on. Um, and the bid kindly let us access that data to inform these projects. It's anonymized and aggregated data from O2 mobile phone and Visa merchant data. And that kind of collectively gives a reasonably good indication of what's going on. Um, I think six cities in the UK have these data cells now. So we're also able to kind of compare the data amongst the cities. Um, and just to include a few examples of that type of data, it's not just the sophisticated football data, which is really valuable, but you can also um, look at the, the kind of type of visitor that you're getting. So their home country, their home city, the type of spender they are. So there's there's, there's a calculation to work out whether they're very high, very low spender. So you can then work out around the city, where do you get, where are certain audiences using the city? Social media sentiment, um, which is kind of useful to, to flag certain events and whether you're kind of trending and things like that. Um, and the footfall throughout the day, all sorts of things really. There, there are several pages to the dashboard and information to explore, but what that means is that we can that can inform our scope of our project because we understand our target audience as well as kind of giving us those metrics to monitor success over time which is really great um, for our funders so that's a whistle stop tour of the muscle quarter project thank you everybody thank you wendy that's perfect i feel like we should be applauding at this point they've been brilliant presentations from all of you thanks very much and uh it's sparking quite a lot of uh, interest and questions. So I think we'd probably better just plow straight into those um, if everybody's ready. I'll, I'll take the ones that we've we've been sent in uh, so far already and then um, we can we can follow up uh, if we have time with others. Um, there are a couple on parklets, which are obviously quite close to our hearts. So I, I think maybe for Wendy and Emily, um, 
more to answer um, from Stephen. Is there a danger that public money will be spent on streets and areas which are already successful, i.e. that don't need the additional investment as it is in normal times already full of people? And he, he mentioned South Bank particularly where he's seen that. Uh, and then there's a second question from Stefano who asks um, how important weather is to the success of the Parklet complex, sorry, concept and its effective effectiveness across the UK. So I don't know if, if one of you would like to take those and go first. Um, yeah, happy to start. Um, okay. I think in terms of the question around the distribution of the funding for the parklets, I mean, from our perspective, because we are all where our projects are externally funded, we essentially have to justify spending certain locations on certain things. So through those funding bids, we'd have to justify using data, um, the kind of social and economic value of that intervention. So I think if we were proposing to spend X amount of money in a place that was really successful and really wealthy, that funding wouldn't be approved. We wouldn't be able to get that signed off. So there has to be that kind of justification. Obviously within Bath and North East Somerset, there's a perception that our, the Bath is kind of really wealthy, but clearly we're, we're locating those interventions within that context in areas where we know there's lower footfall and we know there's increasing vacancy rates. Um, and on the weather issue, um, I think it, it definitely does impact it, but I'm aware that increasingly um, some local authorities are looking at parklets with roofs as the solution mm. to that. So that's, that's mm. coming up, but I think in a place like Bath, that would have kind of impacts on views up the street and the conservation area. So that might not be something that we could kind of get away with, but it's definitely mm. being looked at. Okay, and Emily, maybe any learnings from Liverpool where it might not be quite as pleasant a microclimate? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, so some of the things that we've considered are, are using planting. Um, so particularly thinking about climate resilient species, um, street trees, mm. it can provide shade, shelter. Um, Liverpool is particularly windy. So that was a concern of some of these spaces outdoors. So we were actually using and uh, thinking about the shape of some of those parklets and the furniture installed to actually create wind barriers. Um, to create more enclosed spaces that feel warmer. Um, mm -hmm. But effectively, I think providing these spaces um, that give flexibility so people can use them in different ways, sit in the sun, sit in the shade um, as mm -hmm. they want, really those opportunities for people to use space um, are absolutely valuable. And actually, if it's any reassurance, there are a lot of parklets in Oslo and uh, they're well used. And it may be because the Norwegians believe that there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. So I think we maybe need to just adopt that as a philosophy um, and keeping on parklets quickly and we'll move on to some other topics. But uh, Phil asks if you see parklets as a temporary or long term solution and are they sustainable? But I guess that's as kind of how long is a piece of string question. And Catherine says she loves the idea of parklets. Is there an ambition to have these as a more permanent installation post COVID in Liverpool and uh, Milson Street? So how long do you see those being in those places? So I think uh, for, the, for the Liverpool example, when we put together the parklet design guide, one of the criteria were that the parklets could be relocated um, and also ensured they, they could be flexible. So mm. we really wanted to inspire and encourage parklet designers to look towards a modular approach um, and something that could be mobile. So once they were installed in a certain street, if that was effective, they could be left there, but perhaps they could be just adapted slightly um, to newer needs, or mm -hmm. they could be relocated completely. So perhaps if it inspired a more permanent transformation in that area of the streetscape, then that park could move to a new temporary location somewhere else in the city um, and trial there, use the monitoring and then look towards a permanent future as well. Mm. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Um, we've got a couple here. I've got one for you, Wendy, later, which I'm saving, I think. But we've got a couple here uh, from Julia. Wondered how you see housing coming into town centres as shops close. That might be one for you, Ben. And also from Paul, what impact will the latest proposed changes to permitted development have if the government proceeds with them? Are you happy to take those? I think they're kind of interlinked. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. OK. Um, I, I, I'm not completely a, a, across the permitted development stuff, but I do have a, a, a basic understanding of it. I think the sort of key principle about high streets is that it's they're, they're going to diversify over over the next 10 years. Um, and we'll see that process happening is already happening now. I think from what I can tell about the permitted development issue, and I don't know who's going for art, Article 4 direction, because people like to sort of 
you know, um, try to protect their, their retail frontage. But we are inevitably going to see much more in terms of sort of flats above shops rather than I'm hoping uh, flats in between shops. Uh, I think mm -hmm. on the ground level, it's much more about diversification towards leisure, hospitality, um, co-working, you know, the, the sort of function of our high streets is going to need to change in those sorts of directions, mm -hmm. education even. But I think in order to sustain that, we need a, a, a lot more intensification in, 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 our, in our high streets and town centres at sort of upper levels to, to get people to move in. I don't know whether my sense about the permitted development rules is that they are it's not it's too blunt a tool to be able to, to to achieve that and i think local authorities are going to have to be really really careful in their development plans to make sure that we're talking about upper levels rather than street level mm, yeah yeah no thank you for that and i think moving on from what you've just said um arthur asks if we look at the 15 minute city model for suburban areas what are the essential draws each local center needs to sustain itself I think that's a, a, a one to add to the end of that answer. I don't know if Emily, you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's about understanding the community um, it is really important. Um, so that's where those partnership models can be really helpful as well, um, is making sure that everyone has a voice who's part of that community. Mm. So through that process, you can really understand what are the key needs, um, what's missing, um, and how can we really plan together to create a vision that encompasses all of those needs and is right for the place? Mm. And uh, we, when we spoke a week or two ago about that to prepare for today, we actually brought in the um, topic. I don't know if people have started seeing that, but they're now talking about a one minute city in Stockholm, for instance. So the pressure's on, I think, in, in all of that. This is one for you, definitely, Wendy. Phil asks, what lessons have you learned from working with highway officers? <laughs> oh I have to be very diplomatic don't I um not not necessarily no <laughs> um I think what I think we're quite lucky in that we have quite a few um officers in highways who really get it and have worked in other contexts and quite quite new to Bath who but who've worked in say Bristol to deliver parklets and similar um but I honestly just think it's taking them on the journey so I think there's in local authority there's prior to Covid there might have been um a habit of planning something entirely and then telling the, the other relevant colleagues at the last minute that you're putting it in, informing them mm. as opposed to engaging them. And I think the same thing applies to internal public sector engagement as it does to say engaging with the community in that it's a little, it feels a little bit meaningless to kind of tell them that you're putting a parklet in three weeks before you put in a parklet in than to really bring them in at that original, that initial kind of visioning um, stage. Um, because then you're taking on board their comments and actually have them meet the manufacturer of the parklet, have, have them do the walk around with the community and the landlord, because then they, they understand the kind of will from the community to deliver it and the way that the manufacturer um, through the design process can really incorporate their specific requirements, be that the drainage mm -hmm. channel or the kind of yellow tracking so that somebody doesn't fall off it. And, you know, all those kind of minutiae that the highways um, and safety engineers would pick up that as public realm designers were aware of, but isn't our kind of necessarily our bread and butter. Um, and then actually what we found is when we put them in and people really love them and you get the shiny photographs with all the, the councillors and the businesses that get put in the papers, the highways guys are really proud of it because they're not used to being involved in stuff like that. They used to mm. be involved in slightly hideous footway widening, like the red yeah. and white blocks that we're seeing across, across the country. So to be able to kind of put their name to it and say, oh, actually, we worked with Wendy to deliver that. I think, I think they are really kind of pleased because it looks nicer and it's, it's, it's mm. more of a showstopper than some of the work they usually get to do. Definitely. And I think we also talked um, previously about the importance of it's, it's in everything, isn't it? And everything <laughs> that we do, but um, breaking down the silo working that we're so used to and particularly even within local authorities, never mind the local authority and others. So yeah. I know I know that's been a key aim for you and it's obviously been achieved. Um, one for you, Emily, definitely. Uh, it may be difficult to ascertain due to COVID, but did the Wild West End project increase footfall? Yeah, so something we monitor across Wild West End as it continues is footfall on specific around specific installations. Um, so as an example, the parklet that was installed had a significant increase in footfall 
um, anecdotally from some of our surveys, we spoke to people who'd actually changed their route to work so they could walk through that street mm -hmm. on their way. Um, and what was really positive is we saw a really significant increase in dwell time. Um, so the fact that people were spending more time there and doing a wider range of activities. So stopping to read, um, have a coffee with a friend, um, just generally sort of sit in that space uh, and engage with, with the planting and other people around them. Mm, the power of plants for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think this may be our last question. And unless we sub suddenly have a flurry, I know we're ending a little bit late because we started late, but maybe one for you, Ben, again. Um, is there a correlation between successful high streets and retail composition? Do viable and vital high streets have a greater number of independents as opposed to chains? That's from Stefano. I love this question. I think at the at the sort of basis of this question is, 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 is a sort of assumption about independence is this sort of a, a monoculture of people that really understand quality and service and and I don't think it's like that I think one of the one of the things that I've really noticed when I've gone to towns is that and really done done work in quite remote towns particularly is that you have whole towns that are completely composed of of independence, but they're not the independence that we sort of imagine when we think about independence. They're ones that open when they like, and they and they sort of close, they close at four, and they go off to the golf course, and they you go in, and they're horrible to tourists, and they don't have what you need, and all of that stuff. And and I think that we need to think a bit more. I, so I think just in data terms, it's really really difficult for us to be able to say there is a distinction here, and you can measure the different mm. viability between independence and, 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 and chains. As I said at the sort of top of this session, you know, a really good high street is a diverse high street. It's not even just a shopping monoculture. It's not just about shopping. It's about all of those different uses. And I think, you know, having anchors is really important, but having places to learn is really important. Having places that Emily and Wendy are talking about where you can stop and converse and, and you know, think things that reduce social isolation, there's going to be a lot change in high streets and independence are not the be all and end all of it as far as mm. I'm mm. no thank you did you have any thoughts on that emily or wendy and i think we'll close after that yeah i was just going to say um from a kind of delivery perspective and engaging with the businesses we often find it's a lot easier to speak to the guys in the independence because when you walk in the person you're speaking to runs the runs the runs the show so you can say can we help you with an outside table permit can, what's your opinion on this and they're really willing and um kind of interested in getting involved because it's it's like it's their kind of lifeline here um that you're th that we're kind of working with whereas we'll find if we go into one of the kind of multiples on the high street the manager will say yeah okay well that's the email for our central office and you never hear from them again because the guys in the stores don't necessarily have the ability to make those wider decisions or input into the process in the same way that the independents do so i think mm. from delivery that is one of the key differences so it's a lot easier for us to almost help and support the independents than it is the multiples but that's not necessarily where the money lies so it's difficult because it would be great to unlock some of the funding that the, the multiples have to deliver wider mm. projects but it's getting them around the table that's the challenge yeah, so you clearly can't generalise. Emily? That's where the bid is really useful. The bids are really useful as yes. well. So they can kind of negotiate those conversations. Yeah, for sure. Um, a sort of important thing to consider on the design side of things when you're looking at the high street in the space is how um, how that place can spill out onto the high street. So how that business can have an impact in terms of sense of place. Um, and mm. some ways, some of those independent businesses are really... Um, engaging and exciting because they provide something different um, that supports local community, um, really culture uh, and a bit more diversity in the space. Um, mm. So it's really considering the ways that those businesses can have an impact on the street around them um, and create an exciting place that people want to come to uh, and people want to see and can, can go there for a particular reason because it's different mm. perhaps to somewhere else. And that comes perfectly back to SDG 8.9, actually, doesn't it? The, the culture and sustainable tourism aspect, particularly. Well, I, I think that's it from us for today. We'd better wind up uh, shortly. And um, I hope that some of SDG 8, at least, is more tangible and clearer to you now and that you feel there are ways that you can contribute personally, professionally uh, to making positive changes. That is the intent of this whole series. Um, and to make sure you're kept in the loop and hear more, um, many of our FICA topics are also discussed in our monthly newsletter. So do sign up our, on our About Us page on the website 
Um, we've recently talked about using design as a tool for change, anti-hostile design, inclusive public spaces. So make sure you don't miss out. And also social media, if you haven't signed up to Instagram particularly, but any of our channels, um, they may also be of interest to you. So just really, it remains to thank um, all of you for joining us, particularly thank our speakers today. I think it's been a really important and engaging subject. And, uh, you know, we'd love to hear from all of you if you have ideas for future sessions. Um, and thank you for giving up your precious time. We, we know how difficult it is these days. But don't forget these webinars could count towards your CPD commitment, even, even including the speakers, I'm sure, and are directly relevant to the allies uh, requirement for a minimum of five hours each year on the climate emergency, for instance, many of these cover those topics. Also, I need to mention, um, we've just started a new competition uh, with an amazing prize, which you may have read in our newsletter. We're offering a trip to Norway and our new factory, The Plus, in 2022 when it opens, so that you can see our production firsthand and uh, how we incorporate the SDGs into our business. And those of you who view these each month will be logged and the most number of loggings will be put into a hat and drawn out. But please do get in touch. We've got some ideas here for the next uh, series, but any thoughts you have, we'd, we'd love to hear and we'd love to organise them around these. Um, next month, we're hoping, I'm struggling to pin down one of the speakers, but we're hoping to speak about proxemics in uh, terms of practical application. And if you saw the one we held before um, from Nick and Canon, you'll, you'll know what that's about. And it's a, it's a really exciting um, second post really on, on that. So please do keep an eye out for um, our communications and you can view the six that we've already run on catch up. Um, and there are formal CPDs if you're interested as well. So thank you everybody, particularly Ben, Emily, Wendy, again, finally, and uh, Matt and Jack, Jack, who've been dealing with the functions in the background today. Have a good weekend uh, or go hell. So bye for now. <laughs>